So we're going to pick up this story in Exodus chapter 4 and 5 today. And like always in these kind of character studies, we read a lot of scripture. How many are ready for the word of God today? Amen? Okay. Let's jump into Exodus chapter 4. This is now after Moses accepts the, the call, the purpose to go deliver God's people and God's message to Pharaoh. But he first goes to the Israelites. Look what it says. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites. So he's in Egypt and he brings all the elders together. And Aaron told them everything that the Lord said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people. And what were those signs? Well, that's the signs that God told Moses to perform, like the staff becoming a snake thing, the whole like water turning to blood. Like he performed some signs. And because of that, the people believed. And it says that they heard, when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and they'd seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. So I want you to get like the feeling of the Israelites, like what is happening here. For 400 years, remember, they've been enslaved. They have the promise, though, of their ancestors. Like from generation to generation, they've been told, you are a special people. You, this land will be yours. This is the promise of God. And they've been crying out for hundreds of years, though. And then the moment comes. Here comes the deliverer, this prophet, who's doing miracle signs and wonders, and he tells them, God has heard your prayers. It's, it's time. Now it's time. You're going to be delivered. And they get excited. They work. They bow down and we're saying, finally, he's heard us. How many of you can sympathize with this? I really want you to connect with this feeling in this moment that maybe when, when you, got, you got some great news, maybe something that you've been waiting for, or maybe you graduated. We're all the graduates. Right? You graduated. You're like, well, I finally graduated. Maybe you met the right girl, the right guy. Do you remember when you did that? All you guys, you met the right girl, the right guy. Um, you got the job you always wanted. You got the promotion you wanted. It's just the thing, you know, the thing that you've been praying for. Here it is, that moment. They're like, finally, I felt like for like so long, our, my prayers were hitting the ceiling, but here it is, the time is now. Okay, next verse, Exodus chapter five. Okay, it just needs you to feel that with them. Okay, Exodus chapter five says, afterward, Moses and Aaron, they went to Pharaoh now and said, this is what? The Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. That's what God told me to say. I'm telling you, Pharaoh. So that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And check out what Pharaoh says. Who him? You're like, Who's this? who is this? Now look, look, up to this time, look, there is no knowledge of this God of the Israelites. They're an enslaved people. There is no knowledge. Most of the time, the, the dominant power of the culture and of the land, it was their God that was perceived to be the one who provided the blessing and provided the strength and provided the resources. So this is, and he's talking to Pharaoh who thinks him, he's a God. He is a God to the people, which they have a lot of God. So here is this man proclaiming to be a God going, who is this God? Who's this Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know this Lord, and I'm not going to let Israel go. Then they said, okay, here's their second. There's their second attempt now, because it, it didn't work the first time. So they go, okay, well, the God of Hebrews has met with us. Now, let us take, notice that they kind of, now it's a three-day journey. Now it's like, okay, just three days. Can we go for three days? How about that? They're bargaining with Pharaoh now. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to the Lord our God. Or look what they said. He, he could strike us with a plague and with a sword. So they're trying to like pull on his emotions now. And they're like, like please, he's going he's gonna to punish us now. But look what the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said. Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor Get back to work. What's the matter with you? So the Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. There's a lot of productive, productive days you guys are wasting here. So check this out. It says, the same day that Moses and Aaron like, asked, let my people go, to Pharaoh, he gave this order to the slave drivers and the overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straws for making bricks. So they like when you make bricks, you'd have to you know, gather, harvest it, wrap it, deliver it. You'd have to travel for it. There's just a lot of things you have to do to get the straw. And the, but they didn't have to do that. And, but now he's like, don't do that for them anymore. Let them go and gather their own straw. But check this out. He said, but require them to make the same number of bricks the day before. Don't reduce the quota. So things went from bad 
to worse, right? So here they are. They started out with like, yes, here it is. And it totally under-delivered for these Israelites. Now we got more work. Good going, Moses. You're supposed to be this deliverer. And then he says, don't reduce the quota. He says, they are lazy. That is why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. So this message is for anyone today who had something in their life that had a lot of promise, that had a lot of hope, but things just didn't turn out or happen the way you planned it. Okay, this message is like for anyone, I don't know, maybe you got married and you didn't expect it to be perfect, but you didn't expect it to be like this. And things aren't just happening the way that you thought. It's not going the way you planned it. Or maybe you had kids and you're like, I, I, you thought it was going to go one way and it just is not the way. Or maybe it was a job or a promotion or, or a relationship and it's things just didn't go as planned. Some of you, like Moses, you stepped out in faith, like you heard from God and you stepped out in faith, but things didn't go as planned for you. And Moses, in this situation of things not going as planned, Moses is a great example of what to do when things don't go as planned. But I want to look at these other characters as well in this section of the story. There's three other main characters, including Moses, who before. I want us to look at how and analyze, really analyze how we respond when things don't go the way you plan, emphasis on you, on you planning, like, like how do we respond? And uh, based on these four different characters, Moses including, um, I think you're going to find that, I know I did, I respond every one of these ways in different times. I have responded like every one of these people. And I think you're here today because maybe you are in one of these, maybe some things haven't worked out for you. Maybe some things didn't work out the way that you planned for it to work out, and the enemy is using that to get you stuck in one of a few ways. Come on, are you going to ready to study the Bible today, man? Okay, here's, here's the first example, the first character that we're going to look at is Pharaoh. Maybe when things don't go as you plan them to go, write it down this way. Do you harden your heart? Do you harden? So when things don't go as planned, and maybe this has happened enough times, for like with each time, our heart just becomes a little harder and a little harder and more like things just not happening the way it was supposed to, the way you planned it. And little by little, your heart just gets harder and harder. So that may show up and you like, you just don't trust people anymore because they failed you enough. Some of you stop trusting men. men. You don't trust men. Some of you don't trust women because you've, you know what I mean? Some of you, some of you just don't, you, some of you don't trust the system. You don't like, like some of you, some of you check this out. Some of you don't trust churches. Because you've, you know, it just happened enough for you. Some of you don't trust pastors or leaders. And it's, your heart is becoming hard. Now listen, it's impossible to have hope with a hard heart. All right? Not in your notes, but Hebrews chapter 3. The Bible says this. That with the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit says. And I believe God is saying this today. Look at this. Today, when you hear his voice, and you're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit today. Here's what he says. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did. You know what people often say when their heart is getting hard? It's a sure sign that, they're, that if someone's starting to get a hard heart, they'll say something like this. I don't even care anymore. Usually it's preceded by a pfft. Pff, I don't even care anymore. Pff, 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 pff. Just all this, like, I don't even care. And, like, like I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care anymore. I used to care. I, just, I used to care a whole lot, but I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I don't care anymore. And just the fact that you would say that shows you still care. You obviously care. You got all this emotion. I don't even care. I don't even care anymore what happens. Okay. Look, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this because we have this going on inside of our hearts because this is one of the biggest lies you can say to yourself, I don't care. And the reason why it's a lie is because it's often what we say when, not when we stop caring, but when we don't know how to deal with it or when we're not willing to deal with it. Like you already know what you're supposed to do and what you need to do. You've already been proven that what you've been thinking or doing is already wrong. And you're like, instead of just humbling yourself, you go, I don't even care anymore. Oh, who am I talking to today, man? Who am I talking to today? You already know what you should do. You already know you're wrong. You are wrong. 
and you know it. And instead of you humbling yourself, I don't even care anymore. Yeah, you know what that's a sign? It didn't go the way you planned it. And your heart is getting hard because of it. And, and we got it like, the people who say, I don't even care anymore, they're, you know, I know, they are the most like, easily offended people on planet Earth. I don't even care anymore. I don't even care. Like, like, those are the people that get so, you're just, you can't, you don't know how to forgive people. You're always mad at people. I don't even care anymore. I don't care. You got such thin skin and a hard heart. And we need to, we need to figure out how to, how, to, how to have a thick skin and a tender heart. Because there's stuff that's going to happen in this world, and it's not going to go the way you planned it. It's not going to go in the timeline that you planned it. What happens when it doesn't? When it doesn't go the way you planned it, some of you have developed a hard heart because of that. There's this Pharaoh is, I think he's not, he's not trying to make a bad decision in subjugating Israel. He's trying to make a good decision for his nation. He's trying to, like, he's like seeing that, oh, they're numerous. There are too many people. Let me enslave them. So he's trying to make a good king decision, albeit very simple, very evil, but he's, in the, he's trying to make a good decision to protect his people write it down like this. See, what you think that is intuition could actually be insecurity. What do I mean by that? Okay, so the Pharaoh, he treated the Hebrews harshly because he didn't feel secure. And the reason why some of you are so hard and you treat people the way you do is because you're not secure. And your heart has become hard. It's actually not about them. It's about the hardness of your heart. It's about how you responded when things didn't happen the way you thought it would happen. Like Christians with a hard heart, they think they're being discerning. I just discern. Like you're being led by the Spirit or something like that. And really what it is, you're not being led by the Spirit, you're being led by your insecurity. Okay? All right. All right. So, so look in Exodus chapter 4, it actually was part of the plan of God that, that this whole this scenario, what happened? Exodus chapter 4, look what it says. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh. This is like before he goes. He was telling Moses this. See that you're going to perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And some people read this first and they go, that's messed up, God. Why would you do that? Why, you, why would you harden his heart to not let the people go? But if you read Exodus 4, 5, 6, 7, it actually says a couple of times, several times actually, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then other times it says that God hardened his heart. What is, what is clear is that both God and Pharaoh were active in the hardening of their heart. And I think the point is this. You, you better be careful of developing a hard heart because God will make an example out of you for someone with his heart. Oh, <laughs> That was much better than y'all were. So are you with me today, y'all? Okay. Is it sinking in deep enough for y'all? Okay. So this is, it went from bad to worse for the Israelites. Their labor is harder than ever. There were once, they were just a moment ago excited about this thing, right? Yeah, Lord, deliverance is, is coming. It's finally here. Our prayers are answered. And then they get more work, more trouble, more beatings, the no quota change, and so Moses has to go back to them. Look at this. It says, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen. They didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. See, when things don't happen the way you plan them, you got to guard your heart. Because some of you, if you don't guard your heart, you're not able to even hear from God. You can't listen to the plan of God anymore. Why? Because you're so discouraged that it didn't go the way you planned it to go. So here's the second way we respond when things don't go as we planned it, like the Israelites, write it down like this. Do you let discouragement derail you? Do you let, like, discouragement is a temptation that is common to man. Every single one of us has to, like, address and deal with discouragement. Every one of us. But in dealing with it, sometimes we need tenderness, and other times we need toughness. Right? Like, sometimes it just depends on the, on, on the discouragement, but either way, discouragement should never be tolerated discouragement should never be tolerated or wallowed in. Listen to me, it must always be fought against. Always fought against it. If you linger in discouragement, I'm telling you, it can cost you so much. 
discouragement, that hopelessness, and that sense of defeat can zap your energy and vision. How many of you have been so discouraged that you're just tired all the time? Come on, how many of you are there right now? You just feel so, you're just tired all the time. You can't, you can't get yourself up to work out anymore. You can't even like read anymore. You can't really just like, you don't even want to go to work. You don't even really, it's hard to just drag you dragged into church. You're trying to smile, but you are like, you're just, your courage is not only that, not only will it like, it'll, it'll zap your energy and your vision, but it will, it will like rob you of time. Like you'll sit in that season and that season, those weeks will turn into months and months will turn into, turn into years and you're just discouraged sitting in that place. And maybe you've noticed as well that discouragement is contagious. You get around that discouragement enough and it, it just takes your faith. It robs you of faith. And check this out. When we feel discouraged, here's the deal. We want comfort. And there's nothing wrong with wanting or feeling the, the need, you know. It's fine to feel, but the comfort we often turn to are ways that avoid our fears rather than ways to gather our courage and muster our courage to face and overcome them. What God told Joshua, not in your notes, but remember what God told Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, he said, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. You know, it's a command of God to not be afraid. Do not fear. That is a command of God. You know what is also a command of God? To have courage. That is a command of God. It's, it's, it's totally different. Different command and a totally different thing to not fear. It's, it's very different to have courage. Because you can not fear and still not have courage to do what God has called you to do. If there are both commands to not have courage. Fear, but to also muster the courage to do what God has called you to do. Jesus does not want you discouraged. If you look in John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus commands us not to be discouraged. He actually is talking to his disciples, and this is the moment of time in life where he's like about to be brutally, you know, put to death. This would have been the most discouraging experience the disciples ever faced. And he tells them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. See, these are more than just words of comfort. These are words of command. He knew, he knew that it was gonna get really bad. It was gonna look really bad. He knew it was gonna look like this was a critical hit, that this was mission failure. It's all over. He knew that, and he told them, don't get caught up into that. So what do you do instead? He says, believe in God, believe also in me. So what, what is causing you to be discouraged today? I guarantee it's this. Something didn't go as you planned it. I guarantee you, that's it. What, what is discouraging you today, something did not go like you planned it to go. But I'm telling you, if you're discouraged, it's time to fight. Not time to pout. Not time to shrink back. You need to think of discouragement as your faith being choked. See, when you're choking, it's not time to plop down in front of the TV with a plate of comfort food and medicate your melancholy. You need, to, you need to dislodge the obstruction so you can breathe. You're in the fight of your life and you don't know it. Your marriage is in the fight. It has no breath and you don't know it. You're just sitting and wallowing in your discouragement. Your kids are in the fight of their life and you don't know it. You got no breath. No breath. And you need to dislodge. You know how you dislodge an obstruction in, in your faith? By the promises of God. It's by knowing and trusting the word of God. The Bible tells us that through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Romans 15 and 4. That's not even in your notes, but here is what is. Romans 8. Look what it says. We, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Hey, when things don't go like we planned, is that what's going to separate us? Is that what's going to continue to take you out of faith, take you out of church, take you out of your calling, take you out of your purpose? Who shall separate you from what God has called you to do? Shall tribulation, is that going to do it for you? Shall distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? He says, no, 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 not me. Come on, somebody. No, 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 not me. In all these things, I am more, I'm a muster the courage to attack this thing. I'm not getting, I'm not gonna stay here in this discouragement. I'm excited right now. Y'all give me, some, come on now. My goodness. I feel like I'm fighting your battle for you today. 
We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Here's what he's saying. Look at this, look at this. Don't, don't let your heart be ruled by what you see. Let it be ruled by what Jesus promises you. Okay, you gotta trust in the word of God. That's how, you, that's how you dislodge it. That's how you get your courage back. You trust in what he's told you, not what you're experiencing. Here's what, God, here's what Jesus promised you, John chapter 16, 33. Here's what he said. I've told you these things so that in me you would have peace. Because in this world, it ain't gonna go like you plan. It's not gonna go like I plan. He said, he gave us a promise, like in this world, it's not gonna go like you plan. It's going to be troublesome, but take, someone say take. Man, you gotta go back and take your heart. Mm, some of you lost your heart and you're sitting heartless and hopeless. You got you to gotta get up and grab your courage, grab your faithful. Some of you need to get up and find someone to pull the Heimlich on you. I don't care what you need to do. Go get it. Go get your courage back. Go take your heart back. He says, I have overcome the world. See, some of you, like it didn't happen the way you planned and you've got a hard heart, man. It's got some calluses on it, some of you have got, you're discouraged. It's taking your energy, taking your vision, is stealing your time. Let's continue this, Exodus chapter seven, verse eight. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it'll do that thing I taught you. Remember I taught you that, Moses? Do that thing. Do your thing, Moses, okay? Okay, and it's gonna become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw down the staff in front of the Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. But check this out. Not like the Israelites who were like, whoa, miracle, sign of wonders. We believe. No, Pharaoh, Pharaoh went to his custom and culture for the answer or replica of what they were doing. Are you following me okay? So instead of believing the sign, he went to, the, to his, his culture to grab something that was similar, but inferior. Okay, look at, look at it. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men, the sorcerers, the Egyptians, and the magicians, also did, look at, the same things. And the enemy is trapping some of you with what he's calling the same thing. Oh, you don't need to do it that way. I got the same thing for you here. Nah, you don't need to go to church for that. I got the same thing. You don't need, that's, you don't need to get peace there. I got, you don't need to get pleasure there. You don't need to find fulfillment in here. No, no, no. I got the same thing for you. You don't need to do it his way. I got, are you guys seeing this? Okay. Okay, so he offers the same thing, and it's a trap. The magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But check this out. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. See, that's not what he'll tell you. He, won't, he will tell you it's the same thing, but it's inferior. It is, it, so this is, this is what some of us, when things don't happen the way we planned it to happen. Here's what some of us do. Maybe you're like the magicians, all right? And here's what they did. Let me write it down this way. Do you settle for the world's results? So things didn't happen the way that you planned it to happen. Do you go back to the world to find another solution? Do you go back to the, to the next book, to the next class, to the next relationship, to the next high, to the next, like, do you, do you, do you try, do you, tr are you going to God's way or are you going to continue to try the world's ways? You think when you, when things don't go as you plan, do you continue to settle for the world's results? You know what the definition of insanity is, right? When you do the same things over and over and over again and you expect a different result? Yeah, and, and so some of you are in this, you're in a pattern where it didn't go as you planned and sure you got, you got hard and you got discouraged but you just went to a different plan of what the world offered, okay? And, and I think it's very cool a cool story in the Bible here, it really is, that these magicians that practiced secret, secret arts, they were able to, to replicate the miracle of God. Isn't that crazy? But they got some power. They got some power. It's an inferior power, but they were, able to, they were able to replicate that. The more valuable something is, the more likely it is to be counterfeited. Let me say that again. The more, the more valuable something is, the more likely it is to be counterfeited. That explains why we have fake Rolex watches, right? Why there's fake Gucci bags. Why, why some of you are wearing fake clothing today, you know what I mean? 
Why? You know what I mean? Some of you are wearing fake Jordans. You're like, this, no, it ain't a Jordan. Shut up, shut up. Those ain't Yeezy. Stop it. You didn't pay $800 for those shoes. Stop it. Okay? But that's like anything that's valuable, there's going to be counterfeit here. Check this out. Write this down. God creates Satan counterfeits. This, this simple truth will unlock a lot of the Bible for you. Okay? That God is the only one that has creative powers, meaning he makes something from nothing. He manifests that. He, can, he alone can create. The devil cannot create. He cannot manifest something from nothing. So what he does is he counterfeits the creation of God. I'm telling you, when you see this, it'll unlock a lot of truth in the scripture to you. Like Satan is the counterfeit God. Okay? Demons are the counterfeit angels. The world is the counterfeit kingdom. Lies are the counterfeit truth. Demon possession is the counterfeit of being filled with the spirit. See, the the power in a counterfeit is that it deceives someone in wrongly believing that what they have is real, that it's true, that it's actually valuable when in reality it is fake, phony, and worthless. And it's for this reason that every follower of Christ needs to be able to discern. We need to learn how to discern and distinguish what is created by God versus what is counterfeited by the devil, by the enemy. And so, for some of you, this has been a pattern. Things did not, like you start another thing with a lot of promise and a lot of hope and it doesn't deliver. It was sold to you as the same thing, but it didn't deliver. It got swallowed up. It, it didn't deliver like it was supposed to. And you got discouraged and you got hard, but, and, and then you just go to another thing and another thing and another thing. Can I just give you a challenge? I challenge you to try God's way just one time. Just give, give God a try. Just try to give, give him a shot at having the, give God's way a shot. I promise you it is better. It's not perfect and it ain't, it ain't without trouble. It's not without things not going your way. But I promise you this, it is better. There is real joy. There is true peace. There is real love instead of the counterfeit stuff that you kept get, getting disappointed by. Now, for Moses and the Israelites, things have gone from bad to worse, right? They're in the middle of that, and God reminds Moses of this important fact, this very, very central important fact. When things go from bad to worse and it's not going as you planned, look what God tells Moses. Exodus chapter 6, I just put it all the way to all these verses. He says five times, I am the Lord. I know it looks bad, Moses, but I am the Lord. The Lord. I know it's not happening the way you thought it would happen. I am the Lord. I know your marriage isn't what you expected it to be, but I am the Lord. I know you're hurting right now and it's painful, but I am the Lord. Okay, and then he tells them, he says this, and I just put all the scriptures, and I just, there's a bunch of them, but I got, I just abbreviated. He says, and see what I'll do. I will bring. Moses, I'm calling you to be my deliverer, but I will deliver. I will redeem. I will take. I will be. I will bring. I will give. Here's when something does not go the way you planned it. God is saying, I am God, and you're not. So, so here's when, when God's word and God's promises are challenged by circumstances that you're facing. Here's, here's Moses' example, the one I want you to to adopt today. Number four is this. Here's the question. Do you trust God's plan no matter what? Like, see, I don't say yes to my understanding of God's plan. I say yes to God. See, some of you said yes to your understanding of God's plan. When you said yes to God, you said yes. Your yes was a yes to the plan that was sold to you, that you thought you were saying yes to, you said yes to your understanding of the plan and not yes to God. Last week, Pastor John told us, say yes to God. Do you remember that? Some of you were here. That was the, the whole conclusion. Ending was say yes to God. But today, I want to talk to you about how important your second yes is. Like the second yes is not just to the blessing The second yes is to believing that God is working even when his presence is hard to discern, even when the plan is getting thwarted. But I don't know who this is for today. You're on your second yes today. Here's the first yes. The first yes is yes unless. It's, It's yes 
unless it don't work out the way you said it would. Some people approach church like that. Yeah, I'll go to church unless I got something else to do. Okay, yes, yes, I'll serve unless it gets too uncomfortable. Yes, unless, that's the first, yes, I'll give as long as I, unless I don't have enough for me. See, the first yes is, the second, the, the second yes is not yes unless, it's yes no matter what. I don't know who's on the second yes today. The first yes is the stuff we want God to change about us. The second yes is the stuff God wants to do through us. See, even it, you're gonna, every, every follower of Christ is gonna come to the moment of their second yes. Even Jesus had a second yes moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna go to this cross. I don't wanna experience separation. So if there's any other way, because I don't want to say Yes, but in that moment, in that crux, in that crucible of the second yes, Jesus said, nevertheless, nevertheless. See, a real yes reaches past your flesh, reaches past your feelings, past your experience, past your logic, past what's popular, past your opinions, and says, God, I'm not giving you a yes for my flesh. I'm giving you a yes for my spirit. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. The answer is still Yes, devil, come against me. I don't care. My answer is still yes. Tell me I'm not ready for it. It was yes then. It's going to be yes now. Persecute me all you want. I'm going to praise God all the more. It's still yes. It was yes then. It's yes now. It's going to be yes in the future. It's yes. It was settled. Yes and amen to the glory of God. You know, amen is something you say not just when the preacher's preaching good. You know that, right? It's a, amen is a covenant. It's, it's about covenant. See, check this out. Your first yes is about convenience. Your second yes is about covenant. I wonder who's on a sec- I wonder whose marriage is on a second yes today. Your first yes was a yes unless. It was a yes based out of convenience. It was a yes unless you cheat on me. It was a yes unless you stop doing you stop meeting the, the deal here. You stop providing, it was a yes unless, and now you're on a second yes that moves. It, what, it's not a yes based out of convenience, it's a yes based on covenant. It's a yes no matter what. I'm loving you, and I'm not leaving you. I wonder who's on a second yes in their, in their ministry today. Like, like you, said, you said yes to serving God and your purpose and your calling and your assignment. You said yes unless, and your yes was tested, and there was some, there was some difficulty and some hardship, and there was some, there was some trouble, but your assignment and purpose from God is approaching a second yes, where your first yes was a yes based out of your convenience. As long as it's, un, as long as it's not uncomfortable, as long as there's no conflict, as long as I don't, don't get in any trouble, God, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll serve you, but you gotta move to the second yes that isn't based on convenience, but based on covenant. I wonder who's on a second yes here today. Let me show you three things about trusting God when things don't go as planned. Three things that Moses shows us when you trusting God when things don't go as planned. Write this down, write this down. You will never know that God is able until he allows a situation where you are not. See, <laughs> He orchestrated this situation. You know that, right? He orchestrated this opportunity that you're facing right now. And I don't know what in your life is like this today, if it's a physical need, where you have like a need in your life that you don't have enough supply for, whatever that is, whether it's physical or financial or relational, there's just a need that you don't have enough supply for. How many of you wave at me if you're in a situation right now where you have a need that seems more than you have supply of? Anyway, anyway, anyway. I'm praying for everyone without the hand raised who has no room for God in their life. Because the reason why God's not moving in your life is because you're handling everything in your life. If you don't have needs in your life that supersede beyond what you can supply, then you better go back to God and pray and ask him to give you a real vision for your life. Because God will always lead you to a place where he wants you beyond. You're never going to see that God is able until you're in a situation where you are not, come on, raise your hand again now if you're in a situation, you say, I need God in my life, amen? You remember Moses' argument at the burning bush, God wanted to use him, and he's like, but God, who am I? 
who am I? Like, I'm not enough. I don't have enough to do that. And, and he's dealing with that. And he's like, but what if they, what if they don't listen to me? And, 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 you know, I've never done anything like this before, God. I've never done anything. And then, and then he gets to the real question, which is the only question that really matters. He says, but who are you? But who are you, God? And so God is reminding us today, see what I will do. I will bring. I will deliver. I will redeem. I will take. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. God was saying to Moses, and he's saying to you today, when things don't go as planned, as you plan, write this down. Obedience is your responsibility. The outcome is God's. Okay? When things don't go like you planned it, the obedience is your responsibility success failure the outcome is up to god and as we learn to trust him with our future as we learn to trust god with our with our with our provision as we learn to trust god with our love as we learn to trust god with our faith that becomes the foundation to walk by faith. It's not when your circumstances are favorable that you learn to walk by faith. It's by trusting in God when your circumstances are not favorable that you learn to walk by faith. Now I get it because some of you are in real situations where things have not gone the way you planned and it hurts. And I'm not at all undermining the reality of that. It's not good. Let's just be real. I'm going to tell you right now. What's your, some of your experience right now, it's not good. The pain's not good. It's okay to say that. The hurt is not good. The, the consequence, like some of us made some decisions, man, and it's just the consequences of that, whether in ourselves or, or others that we've affected with those decisions, it's, it's, it's not good. But here's what you need to know. When it's not going the way you planned it, if it's not good, God's not done. Okay, when things don't go the way you plan, you need to know these things. If it's not good, what does Romans 8 tell us? It says, God works together all things for the, for the good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So look, look, this is what Moses teaches us. It's, it's a trust God no matter what. When it's not good, it just means that God is not done. Things didn't go as planned for some of you. And for some of you, you got, that, you got a hard heart today. You, your, your heart has become calloused and hard because of just uh, multiple times, after, one after the other, just your expectation not being met. Some of you are letting discouragement rob you of energy, of vision, of time. You're sitting in that place you got of hopelessness, zapped right? Others of you, maybe you've got a pattern for some of you. You keep trying the world's ways. You keep trying the world's ways. Let me go to another thing, another thing, another thing. And, and you just have not really gone to God like all in. I dare you to trust God. Some of you have never even really truly said yes to God. You, and some of you, like you've, you've been around God. I would even say you've been around even church, but he hasn't really given that yes no matter what. You've, you, you're still going to the world's ways trying to get the world's results. And you really, truly have not gone all in with God and tried his way for your life. Can I pray? Can, can, with every head bowed and every eye closed, in this place, can I pray for you? There are some of you that are here today that you have not given God that first yes. And you have, you've developed a pattern in your life that you're trying so many things and, and the things that you try for your fulfillment, for your happiness, for your joy, for all these things, they start off with hope and promise, but they just don't deliver. It's not the same thing. It's not. And you think that you can find it outside of God and it has the promise it can be the same thing and I can get it over here and it never will. It'll never be the same. You were created for this relationship with God and your life will really never make sense and be fulfilled until you have that relationship with God. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you really need to say that yes, yes to God, yes to Jesus, yes to what he did for you on the cross, that he paid your, your debt of sin. You don't have to do it yourself. You can't forgive yourself, clean yourself, fix yourself. Jesus did it for you. And it's only by putting your faith in him can you be saved. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that you should be saved. So with every head bowed and head closed, I'm not going to have you come to the front or anything. I'm not going to sing you out. But right there, if you're ready to surrender the control of your life and say yes, like go all in, try God's way, come on, 
I'm just going to count to three, and I'd love for you to lift up your hand. Be bold with me. Today's the day. Come on. One, two, three. Lift up that hand right now. I'm saying yes to God today. I'm going all in. Yes, yes, yes. Leave it up. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Amen, amen. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Here, 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 here. Over here, over here. Back here too. Back there. Over there. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down for a moment. Hey, can I just... Can we just stay right here, right here in this moment? There are some of you that are on your second yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it may be a different area. Some of you are on the second yes of your marriage. Your marriage is being tested. You're on the second yes of, of, of your calling, of your purpose, of your assignment. And see, your, your first yes was one of con. It was, it was a yes and less, but today you need to make your second yes, a yes based on a covenant. And you say yes no matter what, God. I'm not going to do the whole in and out of faith thing, in and out of church thing, in and out of, of my relationship with you thing. I'm not going to let when things happen like I didn't plan to happen, take me from my yes. Today I'm making a second yes, yes no matter what. What? There are a bunch of you today that need to make that second yes. And if you're here and you want to make it, come on, will you one, two, three, lift up that hand right now. Your second yes, your second yes. Your first yes was convenient, but now it's a yes born out of covenant. It's a yes that's been tested. It's a yes that says, no matter what, God, I will not move from my yes. Yes.